this, it is known as the giant beaver. And the story that goes with the giant beaver is that during the time of the glaciers, there was a glacial lake that was known as Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And that the Indians who lived there began to observe that the giant beaver was eating up all the fish in the glacial lake. And after he finished eating up all the fish, he began to come on shore and eat up the people. And so the people then called on Hobomach to help them in this situation. So Hobomach, being a balancer, came, broke off an oak tree, and he slew the giant beaver by cracking it on the back of the neck and breaking its neck. And it settled down into Glacial Lake Hitchcock. And when Glacial Lake Hitchcock thousands of years later drained away, what they found in the bottom is the shape that looks like a petrified giant beaver. You can see the head, the broken neck, the body, and the tail. So what we know about Hobomach from a different region is that Hobomach could be called on by the people to balance things against harm. So what we figure out is down on the coast where Massasoit was, around from the colony in that whole area, that Hobomach would have been the one entity that they would have called on to balance out against the colonists. So the colonists chose the one entity to block access so that they would not call on Hobomach because they would think that Hobomach was the devil from hell. <laughs> All right, so Hobomach, we see in other places, is a balance. He's not a devil. So this was something that was introduced to us. We had a wonderful place, a place that was in Dios, was in God, that did not have a devil or the influence or the fear of hell. <laughs> I'm glad that you all can laugh about it because I'm still a little scary about hell. <laughs> I, I haven't gotten enough of that cleansed out of me. Okay, so here we are, Hobomach letting the landscape speak for itself. And I took that instruction, and as a result, the following happened. Next slide. Oh, nobody's involved, okay. We went to the United South and Eastern tribes, and as a result, this was the resolution that we cracked. And there are two elements in here, that, well, probably three that I need to share with you. Um, what did I do with my... Ah, the other purpose of this. I was told that this could also be used as a dowsing rod by a dowsing, uh, that the ancients probably had their own tools. But it's also a great pointer. So, United South and Eastern tribes was made up of, at that point, 24 federally recognized tribes. We were dealing with the issue of ceremonial stone landscapes in Acton, Carlisle, Concord, Lincoln, Littleton, Stowe, Boxborough, and Western. And I'd been called there by a man whose name was Jick Davis. And in our office, John Brown and I used to laugh because this guy would call every spring for three years and say, we need somebody to come up here and take a look at these stones that we have and let us know if they need to be protected. So I worked for Mr. Benfield. Mr. Benfield wants to uh, do forestry and get forest credits, but he doesn't want to mess up anything that might be in here. Can you come up here? And we laughed. We've never been called outside of Rhode Island. And been called very little in Rhode Island, but definitely had never gone into Massachusetts. And Jick is insisting. And so we started talking about, oh, it's the crazy guy again, this Jick Davis. You know, this crazy guy is calling us again. In the third year, when he called, John Brown said, look, Doug, go up and see what, my job, right? Go up and see what this is all about. So I went up to Carlisle, Massachusetts, 
And as much as I had laughed at Jake Davis, the laugh was on me. I walked into this pristine ceremonial landscape with ceremonial stones like I had never seen since. Great, great impact. Brought me back thousands of years and then rushed me into what my job for the future would be. So, I get a call from Jake and I'm on my way to the United South and Eastern Tribes meeting. And Jake says, next door, the property next door, they wish to build houses. They want to put in make mansions. There's ceremonial stones there too. What do we do? I said, well, Jake, I don't know what to do. I never had to work out a remedy for Massachusetts or anybody who wasn't Indian. What he asked ended up with the production of this resolution. I said, we're going to create a resolution, and maybe we and you can use it to get these people not to destroy the ceremonial stones. For thousands of years before the immigration of Europeans, the Pawas or medicine people of today's New England region used this sacred landscape to sustain the people's reliance on Mother Earth and the spirit energies of balance and harmony. There are several keys in this, that our ancient belief system was about reverence to our mother, the earth. We acknowledge that we were siblings to everything that had been spawned by our mother, the earth. Every tree, every blade of grass, every ant, every bug, every winged thing, every swimming thing, every four-legged, that all of these were our relatives, our brothers and sisters. And that our mother <laughs> was instructed to all of us of her relationship with our great spirit. So from great spirit's union with our mother the earth, we were all produced. And we know that, and this is what was willing to be acknowledged by the 24 tribes who were gathered together. But it was also about her dealing with the spirit of balance and harmony. So our ancient belief system believed in our mother the earth and believed that she could help control balance and harmony. And so that was why we lived in a place that was called what by Christian components? In Dios? You can ask your questions. Oh yeah, I'm gonna ask you questions. So you're gonna have to listen. All right, so what's it called? In Dios. In Dios. Thank you. And India was called what? Indus. Hindustan. Thank you. All right. You are listening. Okay. Thank you. You get to teach from the back also. So this is the piece that we've only now begun to deal with. And that is that the United, the USET tribes wish to partner with the towns which have stewardship of these properties in order to create historic preservation plans that will support the permanent protection of this or these sacred landscapes. We have just in the past two years begun to develop memorandums of understanding with towns because the towns have jurisdiction over themselves and their, their towns. Towns, and I've learned this recently, are the true sovereigns. Now what are you gonna do when I ask about heaven and... <laughs> you're gonna be here, you'll represent them. <laughs> Okay. Well, Whalen has a memorandum of understanding with our four tribes, the Pequot, Mohegan, Wampanoag tribe of Gay Head of Quinta, and the Narragansett. Uh, we signed an agreement with them that we would support them in the work that they wish to do with things tribal in their area, and that has been working out quite well. Yes, sir? From the list of 
town, all those towns that are eastern Massachusetts, with none on the other side. And you mentioned Turtle Falls and um, Leverett. I'm from Greenfield. Oh, you are from Greenfield? Yeah, I was born and raised in Greenfield. Oh, we got so stuff to talk about. Anything outside of Connecticut, you know, outside of 128. Well, the question, there. the question you asked now leads me to my next point. Thank you. These four towns, not four towns, these eight towns, I called back to Jay, and I met his father, James Davis, Elder James Davis. And I said, I want to read this USET resolution. I'd like to see if there's anything your father thinks ought to be added. And so I read it to him. He said, well, not just Carlisle, but all of our neighboring towns. These stones are in all of them. So put their names in, too. I said, well, yes, sir, I will. So we added the other towns for that reason. I did not know about the ceremonial stones in Western Mass. I did not know about ceremonial stones other than the ones that we had on the reservation. I'm much more educated now that I've been thrown into deep water. <laughs> so, we've just started dealing with MOUs and that part of the first resolution. So in 2002, we understood all of this. In 2002, the ancestors had already projected what we would be doing now. And they laid the groundwork for it. And we are following the mission. I had no idea what an MOU was, did not have an idea of what an MOU would do. And so my life is involved around learning what my job had to be. I'm now a tribal historic, a deputy tribal historic preservation officer. And I carry the specialization as preservationist for ceremonial landscapes. At one point, I argued with my boss. I got tossed out. And when we both decided that I needed to be coming back, he said, well, you need, you need a new name. And so the new name that he and a few others thought of was preservationist for ceremonial landscape. Why did he do that? I've been causing him trouble ever since. Going to the boss, going to court, whatever. OK. Next slide. Any questions about this? OK, next slide. When we talk about stone groupings, a lot of people are talking about cairns. Anybody know what a cairn is? Well, if you are in Scotland or Ireland and you're calling stone groupings cairns, you're spot on. But if you're in Algonquin country or among the Anishinaabeg, we would expect you to learn Manatu Hasunash. Manatu Hasunash. Hasunash. Manatu is the word for spirit, and Hasun is the word for stone. One of the words for stones, and Hasunash is many stones. So. The first preserved stone site in Rhode Island was preserved in the town of Hopkinton, Rhode Island. They had 14 acres of ceremonial stone features, and they had chosen some English name for it. And I said, why aren't you going to use the language of the indigenous people? They said, well, what would that be? And I said, Manatu Asanash. So it's now called Manatu Asanash Preserve. They said, could you spell it for us? <laughs> All right. So this is a Manatu Hasanash, also referred to as a memory pile. These are all stones. We presume, I wasn't there, so I don't actually know. We presume that each of these was a prayer spoken into a stone and placed there by an indigenous person. Because after the medicine people began to do that, and we don't know how many thousands of years ago, the people in general began to do that practice. Next slide. This is on the Narragansett Reservation. And this is another form where you have stones on a boulder. And, my God, 
she got my this long. <laughs> she already left. <laughs> I'm keeping good track of my team here. Uh, next slide. Okay, there should be, no, no you don't have, <laughs> you're, you're doing what you can with the tools you have, and thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, can you see this? Yes. Mm -hmm. This doesn't exist anymore. This, these stones were on a boulder in Upton, Massachusetts. We began to consult on a cell tower project. The landholder said, I want to put a cell tower in the middle of this um, 32 acres I have. We said, what we would like you to do is to have a survey of all the stones on that 32 acres so we can also align it with the mouth of the chamber that is a mile away in the valley. And we want to establish that the chamber is the source of the observation of all of the stones on this hill, both the boulders and the stone workings. And he said to himself, because he never told us, to hell with you. You don't get to tell me what I can do on my property. And he went out there one Sunday with a backhoe and he played golf with all those stones. So they're not there. They're in a pile over behind me. But there's a silver lining to that story, and I'll get to it a little bit later on. Next slide. This is on the same hill. This place is called Crack Hill. And this is, well, I've got to, I've got to go through the silver lining before I can explain what this is. The silver lining is that he was so scorned, or his children were so scorned in school, because he was mistreating the Indians and stuff that was Indian on his property, that he came to the town meeting with the planner. It was a big meeting one evening with the cell tower companies. And he was holding the son and daughter by the hand. And he said, I want you to understand that I am prepared to sell that property up on Pratt Hill that I own all 32 acres into preservation. And I will only sell it into preservation. Well, two years later, we got a settlement on another project out of Connecticut. And uh, the head of my office and I went to him and said, uh, you said you wanted to sell the property. How much are you willing to sell the, 70, the 32 acres for? He said, well, I've been asking 600000 but I'll sell it for 350000 He said, we'll have our attorney come here. We took some of that settlement money, and we purchased Pratt Hill. And the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Trust is the 501c3 that now protects these ceremonial stones. It would have been some other entity because I negotiated the settlement on that particular project. And I negotiated what I thought was a big and fair sum. And there were four tribes involved. And I negotiated it with the understanding that we would all kick in and purchase endangered ceremonial stone landscapes, expecting that our four tribes would buy this place. Well, as before the ink was dry, all the tribes had signed, I was informed, Doug, you can't tell sovereign nations what to do with their money. I said, wait a minute. I negotiated this money so that we could all participate in the purchasing and preservation of endangered ceremonial stone landscapes. Doug, and I heard that kind of, that tone from archaeologists, and I'll get to that in a bit. It was always, little Dougie, you're not wise. <laughs> Doug, we will do with our money as our tribes see fit. That's the right of the sovereign. So I went back to my office and I said to the head of my office, this is what they're complaining to do. Are we going to keep our word? Are you going to help me keep my word to the ancestors? And he said, you made a commitment, we'll honor it. So 
we purchased that property and we now are the protectors. And we have two local ladies who are caretakers. We're not in Upton, but they are. They monitor what's happening on the site and they monitor what's happening with the town. We now have a great relationship with the town. So I have learned to believe in agreements with towns. Since then, we've developed a wonderful agreement with the town of Wendell. And I'm honored to say that the person that we negotiated through is sitting here and is the reason why I'm here today. Lisa, thank you. I didn't know it was going to be this kind of journey, but I'm glad you brought me. Yes. I have cross country skied through one area of West a dozens of times past a rock and snow structure similar to that. How do I tell whether it's of significance? Well, there are two answers to that. First of all, you and I have talked about Jim Maver and Jim Maver and Byron Dixon's book, Manitou. If you haven't gotten it, go on Amazon and get it. That's probably the only place you can still get the copy of the book. M-A-N-I-T-O-U, Manitou. Jim Maver was at Woods Hole, and as you explained to me, and as I'd heard before, he was the developer of the submersible submersible. It was what? The first submersible submarine. The first submersible submarine that could be used for archaeology underwater. Byron Dix was, in fact, a rocket scientist. And the two of them partnered up and got intrigued by these stones in the woods. And their perception was that they were not colonial. They had not been developed by Irish monks. They had not been developed by the Vikings. They had not been developed by little green men or colonial farmers. That these were indigenous. And they wrote a book that looked at that as the logical concept. And that book is Manitou by James Mabel and Byron Dix. Yeah. I had trouble reading Manitou, cover to cover. I could go into pieces of it, but I could not go cover to cover. And it wasn't until I began to call on Creator and the Ancestors to give me guidance that I could begin to read the book and I could begin to go and ask the proper questions. Okay. We now know that the Narragansett Tribal Historic Preservation Trust is the proud protector of Pratt Hill. This is a circle, a shadow casting circle, a calendar that is just off of our property. It's in DCR property, so it's a part of the Upton State Forest. I go there often, but I have no jurisdiction over it. The ladies who are the caretakers go there often. One of them does a lot of work with the moons. And so she was the first to go out there and spend the night and look to see if there were lunar cycles that were related to this. So it not only casts shadow in sunlight, but it casts shadow in moonlight. And the shadows are cast not on the stones, but between the stones. And that's a part of determining certain ancient calendars. And we have found these in different forms in other places. Next slide. What is that? Thank you. Most people don't want to believe it. They want to fish around. It's got to be something. Yeah, it's terrible. It's what's obvious. Head, carapace, front paws, their rear paws, and there's even a tail. And the turtle will be seen in many manifestations, some not as well defined as this. But I was asked about 
people being able to sense. I think, who, whose question was that? It was your question. Out in Western Massachusetts on the gas line project, for which I am now going to court. We were identifying the ceremonial stones. We identified 73 of them in this section of right of way. I had the tribal representative from the Pequot tribe out there, the tribal historic preservation officer. And she, I, I could feel that I was in an important area. She walked up and she said, right here. Well, when somebody's that in fact, I step back because they know something that I don't. She said, it's right here. She said, I don't know what it is, but it's right here. Well, she was not there the next day. She didn't stay over there. And the young man who, and I who were looking began to remove the duck and the leaves. And what we came down on was the smallest turtle effigy I've ever seen. And I know it's a turtle because it had a shell shape. It was almost a rectangle, but it had rounded edges. And it had a head sticking up on one end. Then it had two of the elements that you need to be a turtle. <laughs> so I knew I was seeing a turtle. And she had sensed it, and it was underneath a rock overhang that, that she was standing above. She was standing behind the rock, but she knew exactly where it was. 